Tonight, World in Action exposes the men who've launched a campaign of political terror in Britain. For the last year, they've operated in the shadows, with hit lists, death threats, firebombs and attacks on political rivals. Tonight, World in Action uncovers the sinister world of Combat 18. Late last year, people all over England began getting death threats. Some claim to be from the Ku Klux Klan. We have got your location and where you live, and we will be watching you, and we're going to take you out. It's as simple as that. You're nothing but a Jewish slag. You will be taken out by the Ku Klux Klan. Just let another Combat 18 have got our eye on her. We're going uh, to take her out. In a picturesque corner of Norfolk, Alison Lachlan runs a guest house. It's a retreat for people wanting a break from city life. Last year, she donated a weekend here as a prize in a raffle for the anti-apartheid movement. This innocent gesture led to a frightening telephone encounter. He said, um, um, have you ever had anyone from the um, anti-apartheid movement? And I said, yes, I have. I was um, happy to receive some people who'd run the raffle prize. I said, um, you know, in what connection do you ask? And he said, oh, well, we've heard that you've had those people and we don't like that and we're going to make... Um, and I said, well, I'm not sure that you've really got the right impression about this. And he said, oh, yes, we've certainly got the impression about what you're doing. and We don't like it and we're going to be making a a very nasty impression on you. And I said, well, you know, can you just tell me who I'm talking to? He said, it's a, a member of the British Ku Klux Klan. Another victim was Cheshire holiday operator Martin Vasey. Like Alison Lachlan, his generosity had made him a target. We received a call that uh, came on our answer phone one Friday night, uh, a person describing himself as from the, the British Ku Klux Klan. Uh, he said that it had come to his notice that we'd offered a prize to the anti-apartheid movement for a fun run that they were doing down in London. And he said as a result of that, that he wasn't very happy about it and the offices would be attacked. We wondered whether it was a, a bit of a prank, a bit of a joke, um, but it was true that we'd, we had given this prize. Um, so the, the person obviously knew about that and we, we took it seriously enough to contact the local police. I felt distinctly vulnerable, really. I thought, well, is something going to happen immediately? How shall I know? Do I go on trusting people? Do I lift up the phone? And... Martin Vasey and Alison Lachlan and the many other victims of similar threats had no way of knowing they'd been targeted by an extremist group called Combat 18. Nor did they know it was already engaged in physical attacks on people it saw as its enemies. A Combat 18 could be described as uh, an organisation participating in political terrorism uh, viewed in the context of threats of violence and carrying out that violence. Combat 18 is thought to have about 70 active members. It takes its name from the first and eighth letters of the alphabet, the initials of Adolf Hitler. It believes in organising itself on a cell structure uh, not a mass political movement, and it believes there is a certain amount of security in following a cell structure, so that infiltration by the police or security organisations is limited to the persons involved in a particular cell. Combat 18's hit lists appear in its members-only bulletin called Red Watch. Copies obtained by World in Action reveal that scores of people have been targeted. They also reveal why. Combat 18 is a fanatical neo-Nazi group whose intended victims are usually Jews or its political opponents. Several MPs are singled out for harassment. These publications have been called hit lists. Is that fair? I think that's a very fair description because what other interpretation can one place on a list of names and addresses circulated to members, it must be for the purpose of at least harassment. And at worst? and, at worst, a severe physical attack. March the 27th at a bookshop in East London. The quiet of a normal Saturday is about to be shattered. They were wearing hoods with slits, showing only their eyes. 
they had carved and painted wooden clubs. Freedom Press, a small radical publishers for over a hundred years, had become the latest victim of Combat 18. The cell carrying out the attack worked with clinical efficiency. Within a, a couple of minutes, and this happened very quickly, within two or three minutes, they smashed anything to do with typesetting. Um, there's a computer, typesetting machine, uh, and another machine, which is um, a laser jet printer. Um, they smashed that with their clubs uh, and then went straight off out. Definitely this was uh, with military precision. Um, yes, these people knew what they were doing. Before they left, the raiding party left a calling card. Above a door, they sprayed C-18. Until now, little has been known about Combat 18. Its Red Watch hit list was seen only by its own members. The rare copies which leaked out gave only a post office box address in America. But that address is a clue to the shadowy figure behind Combat 18. Greensboro, North Carolina in the United States. In November 1979, right-wing fanatics attack a demonstration against the Ku Klux Klan. They produce guns and they open fire. They kill five people. It became known as the Greensboro Massacre. Pulling the triggers were members of several Ku Klux Klan and Nazi groups. One of their leaders, though he was not present at the shootings, was a veteran Nazi called Harold Covington. The American address given on C-18's Red Watch hit lists is Covington's own P.O. box in North Carolina. Dixie Press is his publishing company, also based in North Carolina. Red Watch describes how any information about potential targets is to be sent to the Dixie Press address and... Our brothers in America will then redirect any correspondence back to our safe address here in England. And in Red Watch, Combat 18 thanks Big H in North Carolina for his help. Tried before an all-white southern jury, all the Greensboro gunmen were acquitted. But interviewed even as his men stood trial, Covington had no regrets about what had happened. I do not give a happy damn about their human rights or anything else. They got what they deserved. You show no remorse toward the, the families or the victims? One shouldn't show remorse for stamping on a rattlesnake. And even then, Covington was talking about a new approach for his followers. We've got a whole new plan, a whole new method of operating that we're going to initiate. It's, it's a response to the fact that the government has tried to kill us here four times in the past 18 months. And uh, it involves putting the party on a semi-underground status, but it also involves a, uh, a whole new tactical direction for the movement. Harold Covington no longer appears in his stormtrooper's uniform, but he's still an active Nazi. And today he's putting into action his plan to build an underground Nazi movement. In his own newsletter, Resistance, he describes how he's setting up a network of cells across the world. One of those cells is Combat 18. Covington is much more than just Combat 18's postman. Last year, after shaving off his characteristic beard, he was staying secretly in Britain. Here, he linked up with British Nazis to set up Combat 18. Travelling on an Irish passport, obtained when he married an Irish woman, he spent last summer in this house in East London. When his cover was blown, he abandoned the house and fled. He hasn't been seen in public since. He was in Britain at exactly the time that Combat 18's campaign of death threats began. It's very significant that Covington is involved. He's not just another loony right-winger attracted by the, uh, the fantasy of Nazi uniforms or Ku Klux Klan. He's a man with a long history of involvement in violent activity. But he gives them the experience of, of organizing uh, on a clandestine basis. He gives them the experience of uh, the use of violence uh, and uh, how to target your enemies, how to collect information on your enemies, which is what his organization was doing uh, in, in America in the 70s. Covington is trying to build a clandestine neo-Nazi organization dedicated to violent activity as he did in America. Earlier this year, one C-18 member broke ranks. We'll call him Simon. Alarmed at what he was getting into, he contacted World in Action. He told us what C-18 was set up to do and how it does it. 
To protect his identity, we've used an actor. But these are Simon's exact words. Well, basically, we're talking about political terror. People on the far right have always said that too much time was spent talking about things and what was needed was action. When the opposition to the far right got organised, and there was a real call for it. And the people involved just decided to put something together and basically give the right-wing punters what they wanted, which is Red's heads being cracked. And soon, heads were being cracked. World in Action has established that at least two serious gang attacks last year, where people were badly injured, was secretly planned and carried out by Combat 18. Tim Heppel was a senior member of the British National Party, Britain's biggest extreme right party, and worked at their headquarters. But the BMP didn't know he was an infiltrator, spying for their anti-fascist opponents. In February last year, he was recruited by C-18 to join an attack on peaceful anti-Nazi campaigners in East London. We knew uh, where they were going to be. We knew where they were going to meet because they put their posters up all around this area and also in South London. So we walked out of the pub and the group that I was with was a skinhead group, um, about 15 of us. Um, and as we saw the leafleters, um, as we approached them, um, there was a skip full of bricks and bottles and we armed ourselves with the bricks and bottles and uh, basically charged into them and they didn't know we were going to hit them until the last minute. I think they actually caught me before I actually made the floor at, uh, and there was quite a few around me and I, when I eventually fell onto the mattress and onto the floor and I saw this one lump of concrete at, that was being held in two hands coming down towards my face. I immediately turned away and uh, tried to bury my head. At, unfortunately, it hit me in the back of the head at, and split my head open. Later, I was told by the police officers that actually came and uh, rescued me almost from the situation, uh, that they had been throwing half house bricks at me while I was laying on the floor as well. If the police hadn't turned up, um, he might have been kicked so badly unconscious he might never have woken up. I mean, I saw his head all open and all blood coming out of the back of it. It was disgusting. And he was sort of, like, whimpering, you know. And also there was the shock, because he didn't see it coming, you know, just straight on the back of his head. World in Action's defector, Simon, was involved in another gang attack organised by Combat 18. It took place last August at Brick Lane, in the heart of East London's Bengali community. Anti-Nazi League members were campaigning against a British National Party candidate in a local council election. We decided we was going to teach these people a lesson not to come down Brick Lane when we're there and to let all the Reds know that we aren't going to take any shit. We made our way down the back of the market, went to the shops. We got Lucas Aid bottles, bottles of milk, changed to throw in their faces, picked up stones off the ground, bricks in our pockets, and then made our way down to the paper sale. They didn't seem too bothered at first. They seemed to think they were dealing with the usual shouting and slagging match that there is sometimes between us. But then it just went. We just ploughed into them. It was bricks on them, bottles. We hit everybody we could, turned their stool over, just kicked them senseless, really. The one particular bloke took it very badly in the head, and his girlfriend laid on top of it, but that didn't stop there. But everybody just kick in, used bottles, bricks. I was struck over the back of the head with an iron bar, and then as I turned, uh, I was smashed over the head with a bottle. I think I must have momentarily lost consciousness then because the next thing I knew I was lying in the middle of the street and there was about five of them kicking me to the head and to the groin and there was two of them standing on my ankles to prevent me rolling into a fetal position. The locals couldn't believe it and they've seen a lot of things in Brick Lane. They've seen a lot of violence but they've never seen anything like that before. Everyone was surprised at the ferocity of the attack. Later, Red Watch, C-18's members-only newsletter, was to boast about this attack. A combat 18 unit of 10 men and three members of the NF set out to confront them. With no police or local pack is there to help them, the ANL got battered. World in Action has identified the men who run Combat 18. Charlie Sargent from South London is its main organiser. He's a secretive man, and even many of his Combat 18 comrades don't know where he lives. He has criminal convictions for drug smuggling and offensive weapons. Charlie Sargent's known as the pig. He's a bit of an animal. He loves violence. He's a, he's a knife merchant. He loves knives. He'd stab anyone. He'd stab me or anybody he worked with. If you cross Charlie Sargent or grasped, then Charlie Sargent would have you seen to. Uh, and if he was close enough, he'd do it himself. 
In C18, he's the main organiser. He gives out orders, recruits people. He's the man. Running C18 with Sergeant is Eddie Wicker, also from South London. He's been involved with extremist groups for many years. Eddie Wicker's a bit different. He's a daddy. He's the one everybody looks up to. Running C18, he's getting at what he sees as his natural enemy, which is the IRA, immigrants, left-wing politicians, all the people that have always got on Eddie Wicker's nerves. Combat 18 surfaced publicly for the first time last year. They appeared as a security force, vetting the audience at two right-wing meetings, which claimed that Hitler's Holocaust against the Jews never took place. Next, only a day after their brutal attack at Brick Lane, they joined these British National Party members to support the BNP's council candidate in the Brick Lane area. But the most shameful episode came in November, at a memorial march for a young Asian boy who'd been murdered in Eltham, South London. His family and friends organised the march to mourn his death. Combat 18 and dozens of other right-wingers came to mock and scream abuse. But Combat 18 took a turn towards terrorism when they escalated their campaign against political opponents. In Birmingham, the Democratic left, formerly the Communist Party, has a bookshop. Shortly after its address was included in a C-18 Red Watch bulletin, arsonists struck. They'd uh, broken uh, the glass on the side and uh, poured petrol uh, through the mesh. Uh, that had ignited uh, the books and literature that were in the window. And uh, unfortunately for us, uh, uh, we understand that somebody had discovered them doing this and uh, possibly meant that they didn't carry through as much as they were intending on doing. They could have been quite a serious fire, and we are in a building which is um, a multi-storey building, of very considerable size, and there could have been potentially a very major uh, disaster. Also targeted for attack by Combat 18, were the London offices of the communist newspaper, The Morning Star. It was a Saturday night when arsonists poured petrol through the door and set fire to it. It set fire to the mat inside the doorway and started to ignite the wall there. Very fortunately, uh, we had friends of the paper sleeping in the building at the time uh, because we had just suffered a series of robberies. Uh, they found it almost immediately, extinguished it, and telephoned the fire brigade and the police. That same night, the word C-18 was spray-painted on the Morning Star building. The Morning Star's own report of the attack was later reproduced in C-18's Red Watch. Alongside the press cutting, they wrote Combat 18. One thing which Combat 18 does not advertise, even in the pages of Red Watch, is its close connection with the Ulster Defence Association, loyalist terrorists in Northern Ireland. All the leadership, the top people, what you might call the generals of C-18, are known UDA members. They're in close contact with the commander of the UDA. They organise and run socials, provide security for visiting loyalists in this country. I've been party to lots of conversations with C-18 leaders in a capacity as C-18 leaders and as UDA men. Combat 18 is involved in a race war and seeks to single out blacks, Afro-Caribbeans, Asians, Irish, Jews. The UDA have the know-how to spread terror if that link is made specific and direct. Last summer, the British government banned the UDA in Northern Ireland. It is actively and primarily engaged in the commission of criminal terrorist acts. Uh, in particular, the Ulster Freedom Fighters uh, comprise no more than a cover name for the violent acts of UDA members. But the ban didn't stop the UDA killers. Calling themselves the Ulster Freedom Fighters, they 
stepped up their assassination campaign, murdering 14 people this year alone. Most of their victims were innocent Catholics, targeted simply because they were the wrong religion. I think the violent Nazis preaching a race war, wanting to get hold of guns and ammunition and terrorist know-how, would seek that sort of connection. The surprising thing is the UDA tying up with them rather than the neo-Nazi groups tying up with the UDA. The UDA is still legal in England, and there is no evidence to suggest that C-18 members like Charlie Sargent or Eddie Wicker have ever been involved in UDA terrorism, even though the links between the two organisations are close. Eddie Wicker's very secretive. His function is, well, he's the UDA man. I'd say he's a courier between the two. He's a regular visitor to Belfast, and over in Belfast, he's well-liked and respected. When you're invited, invited to join C-18, that's it. Then you're no longer doing things at the British National Party or National Front. You're doing things that have the blessing, because of who's running it, of the UDA. World in Action's evidence about Combat 18 is now to be considered by a House of Commons select committee. The Home Affairs Select Committee has been concerned over a number of years about racial attacks. What we now have is some evidence of a coordinated uh, attempt to encourage racial attacks. And the Home Affairs Select Committee is going to be very interested in that evidence. And if we find that there is that sort of coordination, we are going to be making some very strong recommendations to the Home Secretary for effective action against it. This is not a political organisation where you might be able to argue one way or the other about their democratic right to engage in the political process. We're talking about a criminal conspiracy uh, and it's up to the police to take action and uh, prevent them engaging in this sort of activity. Organised in cells, using only an American address, Combat 18 has so far operated in secrecy until tonight. I'd like to ask you some questions about Combat 18 and the UDA. I don't know what right. you're talking about. All right. They'll piss off out of it. Mr. Sergeant, we're from World in Action. We'd like to ask you some questions about Combat 18, if that's all right. Yeah. We'd like to ask you about these Red Watch bulletins, which yeah. you produce. Oh, then, produce. Which Combat 18 produces. You're the leader of Combat 18. They're nothing right. more than hit lists, really, aren't they? All right. They're well, hit where, where they're published? They're published in America. So why, do you, why do you well, use an American address, Mr. Sergeant? What have you got to hide? What have yes. you got to hide, Mr. Sergeant? Yeah, why? Why do you use an American address? I can't use it. Is it my address? It's not your address. Why don't you use your own address, Mr. Sergeant? Why do you use an American address? Are you pushing? No, Mr. Sergeant, please, we're not in trouble. Well, yeah, of course he hit me for it. He's not hitting you. You attack hey, well, our camera. Use an American Come on, you're address. Come on, You sell UDA magazines? Yeah, no, no, I sell LPA magazines. The Loyalist Prisoners Association, right, yeah. which was set up by the UDA. Well, I don't know who it was set up by. Yes, you do, Mr. Wicker. It was set up by the UDA, and you know it because you're a member of the UDA. Well, what's it, what, what, is there a law against that or something? Tell us about the arson attack on the Morning Star that Combat 18 carried out. Did, did you order that attack, Mr. Sergeant? Yeah. Did you I? did. Did I? You did. You just no. said yes. Let's go. I said, yeah, did I? Oh, I did say yes. The yeah. attack on Freedom Books the weekend before last, Mr. Sergeant. Did you organise that one? Did I? You tell me. You tell me you do not support the UDA. No, I'm not, uh, there's no comment on that. No Why comment that? on it. Because you do support them, in fact. Well, that's beside the point. Whether I support them or not. No, it's an important point whether you support a terrorist organisation. No, well, I don't class them as a terrorist organisation. But you support them? Hey? But you support them? If it, well, if it comes down to it, yeah, I yeah, would support them. You, would, you yeah. would support them. Do you like to tell us about your relationship uh, with Covington? Yeah, you pay me. What's your relationship with Harold Covington? Yeah, you pay me. So there is a relationship? Is it? You pay me, and I'll tell you. What they do is they kill Catholics. Do you support that? There's no comment on it. What about your relationship with the UDA? Would you like to tell us about your relationship with the UDA, Mr. Sergeant? Yeah, what, what about the UDA? About your relationship ah. with the... Would you like to tell us about it? About the joint activities between C-18 and the UDA? Yeah. Would you like to tell so us about... Put it in your way, this one's going, man. Put it in your way, this one's going, man.